afternoon and good night. My name is Malachi Junior. This is Become the Podcast. How do you become anything? You dream, you declare, you commit, and success is your next breath. So, um, there is no music. There is no music for, I think, the second podcast in a row. Uh, normally, when I record my podcast, I record them on my, pod, my iPad, and then I use my phone to play the music. Um, the, the app that I use has the ability to play music, but oftentimes the music is protected, right? So you got to get them. I have to get the music from a different source. So it has to be a different file. And I haven't quite figured out how to do that yet. And my phone has been going through some things, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, I do all these, uh, podcasts, Acapulco or Acapella, but, um, want to have some fun with today's podcast and just talk sports. Um, I've been watching this narrative kind of unfold uh, with Isaiah Thomas, and um, also been watching some watching LeBron James. And so, I kind of want to talk about Isaiah Thomas, LeBron James. I want to talk about um, the, the 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 goat conversation that they often have with Michael Jordan and LeBron James, but also want to talk about confidence. I did a um, a podcast on January third that said that, that the theme was, "Can you be clutch all game long?" And I, I I used Allen Iverson, I used maybe Carmelo Anthony, I used Isaac Thomas, and maybe somebody else. Oh, oh, and I used Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan to, to, to talk about um, this idea of, you know, is your, is your abilities, is your clutch, is your performance, is your confidence... Is your ability to be clutch? Is it circumstantial? Okay. And so what I was saying is when you when you're getting the ball every time down, when 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 the offense is surrounded around you, it's easy to be clutch, right? It's easy to get into a rhythm. But when you have to be some of these shooters who hardly ever touch the ball, you know, somebody like a Kyle Corver who may touch the ball, you know, maybe once out of three plays, you know, once out of four plays, he may get a shot. You know, every every third, fourth play, or maybe he might run a play for him. But other than that, he's just kind of waiting, waiting in the corner, waiting for his opportunity. It's hard to get into it, and, 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 it's, and it's expected to shoot a high percentage. That's really, really difficult to not get consistent touches, but then also be de- depended upon to to perform on a high level, on a consistent level. And now, someone will say, "Well, it's hard to be given the ball." you know, 18 to 25 times, something like that, and 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 score. You when the, when the other when the opposing team know you're gonna score, when people are game planning for you, yeah, I get it. But if you're a basketball player, if you're an NBA basketball player and somebody's giving you that many looks, you're you're gonna you're gonna be able to do something with them unless you just really aren't supposed to be shooting the ball, unless you really just aren't that good. You know what I'm saying? So if you're getting a ton of opportunities to shoot the basketball, it's on any level, whether it's high school, whether it's middle school, whether it's college, if you're getting a ton of opportunities and you got a high usage rate, you're gonna put up numbers. At some point you're gonna you're gonna figure out how to put up numbers with all those opportunities. But when you don't get a ton of opportunities or when your opportunities are inconsistent and you still relied upon to be consistent, that can be really, really tough. And so what I was looking to so one of the per people that I was looking at in that 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 podcast was um, Isaiah Thomas. And I said, I want, I want to see what he looks like when he starts playing for Cleveland. Because when he played for Boston, they kind of... You know, now, obviously, he could play. Obviously, he could play. And he got really, really hot. And he he was he, he, he just played incredibly well um, in terms of being efficient, um, in terms of just putting up big numbers, scoring the ball well. Um, I mean, the team was the first seed. He was, I mean, he was the number one guy. And, you know, obviously they had Brad Stevens. They had some really good role players. Um, But this guy had an incredible, incredible season in uh, 2016, 16-17 season. But I was wondering what's going to happen when he goes to Cleveland. And now he's got to play with another guy who has a, a high usage rate. And there are other guys on that team that need the ball. And at the time, it was people like Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade needs the ball. He needs the ball. So you got to feed him the ball 
from time to time. You know LeBron's going to have it, okay? Then you have other guys who need shots. They got to have consistent shots. You can't treat them like a guy. You can't treat them like the guy who you can only give him a shot every so often. So somebody like J.R. Smith has to get touches. Kyle Korver has to get touches. Um, and to some other guys on that team that they, they deserve their touches as well and their opportunities. So it's like, man, I wonder, oh, at the time it was like Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose is playing, all right? So the, all these guys need touches, they need opportunities. How is it going to work out for him if he's not having the offense in, in, in the, whole, the entire offense, you know, revolving, revolving around him? How is it going to work out for him? And so what we see now is he's been traded. He's been traded to the, to the Los Angeles Lakers, and there's a lot, of came, a lot of stuff that came out about the fact that he may not be 100% healthy. He uh, may not be in great shape. He um, may not be as productive when you're not using him every time down with high pick and roll or giving him a ton of handoffs and screens to get going. So now all of a sudden when you reduce his usage rate, when you reduce his opportunities, now all of a sudden he's not quite the same player. So now basically the, the narrative is in order for this guy to be successful, you got to give him the basketball every single time down. But at, at 5'11", at, at 5'9", uh, with, with you know sort of a bum hip, which we don't know if he's going to get back to 100% or not, or if he'll or this is, or, or if he can get, or if he can kind of take a step back, but still be really, really productive and effective. We don't know if he'll ever get to that place, okay? Because you got to have legs, and, and this hip injury that he had, he didn't get surgery on it. He, rehabil- he, he just worked on it and rehabilitated it. And sometimes that's not enough. So just want to create some. Just want to give you create a narrative with some numbers. So the the the, the theme is: Is your confidence circumstantial? And so, um, 14, 15, he gets traded to Boston, all right? He, got, he gets 13.6 possessions per contest, all right? So, let's say, just round it out. He gets 14 shots a game. He shoots six threes and seven, and se- six threes and seven twos a game. He averages 19 points, all right? And, and, and his, his uh, shooting percentage was about 40%, okay? So, that's not great. It's not great at shooting the ball at 40, 41%. That's not great. You know, you want to be around 50, you know what I'm saying, at least high 40s. But it, he had just been integrated in the middle of the season, and um, he started to show some flashes of what he could do, okay? So in, in 19 points, is not shabby. So the next year, next year, 15, 16, he goes up to 16 points, 16.9. So you roughly 17 points a game. He's shooting seven, uh, six threes. And 11 twos per contest, right? His point, his scoring percentage goes up to 22 percent, and so does his uh, his uh, scoring average from a percentage standpoint. He starts shooting the basketball at a 42 percent clip. Now again, it's not it's not great, it's not great, but you know, all depending on when he's scoring those points. Is he scoring them in the fourth quarter? Can he get going in the fourth quarter? Uh, it, it, does his activity get people open? Does his activity get people open? So yeah, you can say, look, he's scoring on the 40, he only shooting the basketball at a forty two percent clip. But when he comes off the screen, he's getting Al Horford open. He's getting um, Crowder points because you know he has so much gravity. When he goes to the basket, he's taking two with him. Now he's getting kickouts. Or maybe when he goes to the basket, you know these guys jump all over him. And I, he, when he throws it up, even if he misses, guys are getting wide open tip ins. All right, just because you're, when you, someone is really aggressive, it can still benefit the team, even if they aren't scoring uh, points at a high percentage. You think about Allen Iverson. And when Allen Iverson played, he would take two people with him, you know, most times. So when he takes two people with him, now these garbage men cannot get o- o- easy offensive rebounds and putbacks that they wouldn't normally get if the guy who shot the ball initially wasn't so special, wasn't so gifted, wasn't such a big threat. But then we had that outlier year. That outlier year is when Isaiah Thomas went for 28 points a game, all right? That year, 16-17, he shot the ball 19.4 times a game. He shot eight threes a game and 10 twos a game. And that, and that two percentage is 10.9. So basically, you say he shot the basketball not 8.5 times, and he shot the ball 11 times a game. So that's, that's getting him up there, right? So then his usage rate was 34. That was his usage rate. Before then, it was 32, 29. Then it bumped up to 34, okay? And then 
I will give you some other numbers to help you put some things in perspective. And he shot the ball at a 46% clip. So now he put together a pretty good year. He almost, almost averaged 30. Um, in the fourth quarter, he was dynamic. It was, his nickname was 12. I was Mr. Fourth Quarter, right? His usage rate was 34, okay? And then he was shooting the basketball almost at 50%. And that's a lot of perimeter shots, too. He's, I mean, he's, he would get to the basket, but there's a lot of floaters, a lot of mid-range pull-ups, and a lot of um, shots off the dribble, and into some catch-and-shoot opportunities, right? So to shoot 50, 50, almost 50% or 46%, that's pretty good. But then he goes to Cleveland. Watch how the numbers drop off. So he goes from the previous year in Boston shooting the basketball 19.4 times. In Cleveland, he's shooting the basketball 12 times. So that's 12 less shots. Doesn't seem like a lot, but that's 12, that's 12 less shots, right? His, point per, his point, points per game average are, nine, are 15 points a game. So he goes from scoring almost 30 to 15, all right? His usage rate goes from 34 to 28. His scoring percentage was 37%, and it dropped from 46, almost 11, po 11 points. So now we see that Isaiah Thomas, when given the basketball, right, 19 points, 19 opportunities a game, 28 points per game, his usage rate is up to 34, and then he gets 46% in terms of his shoot field goal percentage. But then when you reduce his opportunities, 12 uh, uh, scoring opportunities a game, uh, his shooting percentage, his usage rate is 28, and then his field goal percentage drops to 37 I was listening to somebody say, well, it's easy to score when you don't have anybody else on your team. It's easy to shoot the ball with confidence when you don't have anybody on your team looking at you sideways because they say to themselves, hey, I, I can do what you're doing. Or if when, you have, when you don't have people that are saying, listen, you shouldn't be shooting the ball like that. You got you to gotta spread the love. So is Al Horford, was Al Horford going to say that to Isaiah Thomas when he's playing for Boston? Probably not. Was Marcus Smart going to say that to Isaac Thomas playing for Boston? Probably not. Was uh, Al Horford going to say that to Isaac Thomas? Probably not. Isaac Thomas didn't play with a guy with a usage, uh, usage rate over 25%, not even 20, 22%. Avery Bradley's usage rate was 21. Marcus Smart, was his, his usage rate was 18. And Al Horford's was... 19. So again, Isaiah Thomas, his usage rate, usage rate is 34. So that lets you know how much he's touching the basketball and how and how little everybody else is touching the basketball. Everybody else has to kind of make a quick decision. Either you gotta catch it and shoot, either you gotta catch it and pass, or you gotta catch it and drop it. There's not a lot of opportunity for you to size up your defender, get into a rhythm and shoot. The only person out of this group I would say played a lot of Dribble the most was probably Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart is 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 a, is a ball handler, so he probably played a little bit of pick and roll, right? But he didn't play as much pick and roll as as Avery as, as um as Isaiah Thomas and Avery Bradley. Although he has a high percentage usage rate, Avery Bradley came off of a lot of screens. He still was a secondary ball handler, but again, only did you compare twenty one to thirty four? It's not even close. And then Al Horford. You know, he's going to handle the ball a little bit because of offensive rebounds. He's going to do some uh, some handoff stuff, right? He's going to do some playmaking too, but he does it in a different way. But again, all those other guys, Amy Bradley, Marcus Swan, Al Horford, they got to be catch and score guys, catch and pass guys, catch and drive guys, catch and finish guys. They don't get a chance to lie, lace up, you know, uh, they don't get a chance to size up the defender and then, you know, get into a rhythm and then shoot. And so when you get this opportunity with a lot of opportunities to dribble the basketball, touch the basketball, you're coming off screens, you're touching it. You're coming off handoffs, you're touching it. You're getting the ball for pick and rolls, and you're touching it, right? Not to mention broken plays. They're looking for you. 5-4-3-2-1 situations. They're looking for you. It's easy to get into a rhythm. It's easy to kind of feel confident in a fourth quarter about shooting the basketball. You, you've gotten so many shots up throughout the course of the game. Now, you, you, it's easy to get into that rhythm. 
But then he goes to Cleveland and things change. Now he plays with another player whose usage rate is at 30.8. So you might as well say it's 31% usage rate in LeBron James. Now things change. So you, you see that when you when you, some some of these ball players are confident in the right circumstance in the right situation. And that's why I always go back to is your confidence circumstantial? Now we all know that just about anybody can be can thrive in the right situation. Some people used to dog Draymond Green because they say, well, yeah, he's he's succeeding because he plays in a system. Well, everybody in the NBA is playing in a system. And anybody in the NBA can go from having a not so hot career to going to a place where you know things work out for them and all of a sudden they're they're an all-star or they're a fringe all-star. Isaac Thomas was in Bal- was in Sacramento. Things weren't working out for him. He was he was put to the bench because he had to play with uh, Cousins, and Cousins didn't like him because he probably was like, "Listen, man, I I do a lot of what you do. I handle, I dribble, I set my shot up. You know, I can shoot threes, I post up, I can do all this stuff, and I'm bigger, and I can do it in a, in a in a way that's more dominating and dynamic." You shouldn't be doing this. I need you to come down and, and, and shoot the ball less. Look for me more, right? Set us up. You know, take take you know pick pick your spots better. But I'm the premier talent on this team, and because of the tension, they put Isaiah Thomas to the bench. And eventually, eventually they traded him to Phoenix. And in Phoenix, they had like three point guards over there. So they had Dr- Dr- they had Gorgich, um, Dragon Gort. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name. They, uh, I can't remember his name. He plays. He's the point guard for um, Miami. I, I I I I know who it is. I can't say his name correctly. But they also had, um, oh my gosh, they also so they had so in Phoenix. He had to play with. Um, <laughs> I the times had to play with the point guard from Miami Heat, and he also had to play with the point guard for. Uh, Milwaukee Bucks. He played for Kentucky. Oh my gosh, what is his name? I know if you listen, you're probably screaming it out at me, but I can't figure. I can't remember it. But he had to play with two guys. He had to play with two other point guards. He had to play with two point guards, and so things weren't really working out. And eventually, they traded him just to kind of get rid of some talent, just to get just to kind of get rid of some 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 competition. And then he goes to Boston, and things work out for him. And he has that breakout year where he plays incredible, but he, he was getting the ball a ton. So that's when normal situations where his guy may not be good, but then you put him in the right situation and that guy's prepared, all of a sudden things you know, things work out. Now you have an outlier year. But when things aren't perfect, when the conditions aren't perfect, when you have to take a reduced role, reduced role, can you still be effective? And that's the whole premise of this theme is can you be effective in all situations or most situations or are you just effective in the ideal situations it's just something to think about I used to always think about the Miami Heat when they had LeBron Bosh and Wade how tough it was for those guys because all three of those guys were probably looking at each other saying if I shoot this basketball what is this? All, what are the other two All Stars going to think when I shoot it? See, it was easy for Bosch to put up numbers when he was in Toronto. Who is he playing with? Same thing. After Shaq left, it was easy for Dwayne Wade to put up numbers in Miami. Who was he playing with? For Cleveland, when LeBron was playing in Cleveland the first time, it was easy for him to put up numbers and, and, and shoot the basketball in clutch situations. Who are you playing with? If you're not playing with anybody clutch, you can shoot the basketball because at the end of the day, you can say, "Well, shoot. Who else going to shoot it?" Which one of you are, you know, talented enough or, or, or good enough to shoot the basketball in this situation? Or, or which, one, who, who, which one of you guys should be shooting the basketball in this situation other than me? But then when they all got together, it's like, okay, Chris Bosh is shooting the basketball in this big situation and taking it upon himself to score. And he's looking at Dwayne Wade and LeBron James thinking, shoot, they probably could have shot that. Or they're looking at him like, bro, we could have did that. We could have we shot a step back. You know, 17-footer. LeBron, same thing. When he's trying to go to the basket and trying to take it, you know, trying to do what he should do in Cleveland, he's looking at those other guys thinking, shoot. Dwayne Wade probably saying, I could have I could have did that. Bosh, same thing. And even though it was Dwayne Wade's team, 
then Wayne Wade is probably looking at those two guys thinking the same thing. I, you know, I wonder if I, I wonder if I should have passed it to one of those guys. But when you get when you look to the left and to the right of you, and there's nobody that you should be that that that, that can justifiably say you should be passing to me in this situation, right? Then it's easy. It's easy to it's easy to score the ball. It's easy to shoot the basketball in clutch situations. It's easy to, you know, get, you know, find your rhythm and get your shot off. It's easy. So is your confidence circumstantial? It's just something to think about. Just something to think about. It'll be interesting to see what Isaiah Thomas does with the Lakers. Um, he plays with a point guard and, I, and, and ball who wants to give, give 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 him the ball, who wants to give it up. Um, and he doesn't, you know, do a lot of dribbling. He's a low maintenance player. Alonzo Ball is. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if they'll center the offense around him or how they'll highlight him or feature him. And it'll be interesting to see if his body is able to produce uh, enough quality production that would justify them giving him the basketball, uh, you know, at a high usage rate. So it'll be interesting to see how that works. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with him because if LeBron's coming, he's probably not, he probably doesn't want to play with Isaiah Thomas, so he's going to be shipped off somewhere else. So now, do you go to a better situation or do you go off to a lesser situation? Do you go to a situation where it's like, you know, we just want, you know, you, you go to a situation where like, let's send them back to Sacramento or send them to, you know, uh, some some market that, you know, is on the, they're, they're, they're tanking, they're, they're, they're trying to get a high draft pick. Uh, you don't have a lot of fanfare there. Will they send him off anywhere? Will he thrive then? Will he be able to replicate what he did in Boston? Or will they send him to a contender? Will they send him to somewhere where, you know, they already are on the brink of either getting to taking a late playoff run? And then if they send him there, are they going to say, listen, we've already had a lot of success. We've been in the playoffs. Are they going to change their offensive scheme to accommodate him and give him the touches he needs so that he can be effective? So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Isaiah Thomas now that he's not playing for Boston anymore. Um, so that's the one thing. So just a little quick um, conversation about LeBron James. So what, it's, hard, it's easy to have the conversation about who's the GOAT. Is it Mike? Is it LeBron? And, and Mike's LeBron's numbers are incredible, especially when you consider he, you know, the longevity, the consistency. Um, he didn't go to college. He, he didn't have great coaching in college, and he's been able to come to the NBA and from day one be a threat, not only physically but from a mental standpoint. His basketball IQ has been off the hook. And so, as he's played a lot of num- played a lot of years, he's accumulated some pretty good numbers, right? And so, at some point, you start saying, "Well, you know, you want to compare him to Mike, but you know, Mike played three years in college, and so uh, of course his numbers are going to his numbers are going to be better than Mike's. He's been playing for fifteen straight years. Mike took two years off. You know, you can kind of come up with all these different reasons why his numbers are going to be better than Mike's." Uh, especially in some in some categories, just because he's been playing longer. But then you also have to remember that for Mike to have played a short amount of time and have accumulated as many points, rebounds, assists, as many stats as he did is impressive. But what LeBron James is doing, it, it's, it's hard to argue that it, it's, it's just hard to keep him out of the conversation. And then when you think about um, playoff success, now, the, the narratives are, are, are really hard to, you know, pe- people who love Mike would just say, well, Mike won six. He's six for six, no game seven in the discussion. But some people will say, but this guy, LeBron, is on his way to his, like, something like eighth and ninth finals appearance. That's impressive. That's impressive. To get there and some of the teams that he got there with, it's impressive. I mean, he drug some... Some some bad teams. LeBron has never played with a uh, uh, another superstar. I don't I don't know if he's ever played with another All Star outside of his days in Miami. So so yeah. So then it's Kyrie. So so before 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 Miami, I don't know how many other All Stars he played with. Right. 
And he didn't, I don't even think he played with any fringe All Stars. And he still was able to do some damage. And he beat that Pistons team when they were rocking and rolling. I forget what year that was. I think that was, maybe I think it was 06. But that's when they had, you know, that's, that's, that's two years removed from the championship year. And a lot of those guys were still in their prime. A lot of those guys were still very, very good. They were giving the, the, the league a headache. The Pistons were. And that man scored, like, I think 20 some points in one quarter all by himself. So it's hard to ignore the fact that LeBron's had so much success in the finals and to the point where it's like it doesn't matter how good Toronto played, doesn't matter how good Boston played, doesn't matter how good Washington was in the regular season, it doesn't matter how good Cavaliers played, everybody knew that when they get into the playoffs, LeBron goes to a different level and those teams don't have a chance. And we've seen it several years, several years in a row. Whenever LeBron wanted to take it up a notch, those teams didn't have a chance. They couldn't do it. They couldn't beat them. But I think this is there's, there's something else that we have to talk about that kind of separates Mike from, from, from LeBron. It's the narrative. So statistically, you can, you can they say numbers don't lie, but they do, they do confuse. So numbers may not lie, but they do confuse. If you look at the numbers, the numbers alone, you can create a narrative. You can create a narrative for... LeBron being as good as Mike, if not better than Mike. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can come up with a narrative, right? Or you can come up with an argument. But the, the storyline, the storyline for me is what puts Mike at the top, the undisputed GOAT, the undisputed best player of all time. It's the storyline. And I will, and I will for the, any, any of the, Old, the people who are older than me that may listen, we won't discount Kareem because Kareem, Kareem still has all the records, right? He still has all the records. When we talk about Mike's narrative, um, what he, how he came to work, how he went about his business, getting better every year, how he attacked. People like the Pistons, he didn't fade. He didn't he didn't run away. When you see Mike getting hurt, when you see Mike getting hit, it's because he was going to the bucket. And this isn't in the league where you had all these three point shooting. That's from the league where you had a, a, a power four and a center that prayed primarily around the basket. So there's always bodies down there. You had a lot of mid range shooting. So a lot of the, the schemes were designed to get guys mid range shots. So you got a lot of activity within the three-point line. You may have had a few guys, uh, maybe a couple guys on every team that could shoot the long ball, maybe one. I always remember Jim, uh, Jim Paxson could, sh- could shoot the long ball. Craig Hodges could shoot the long ball. Um, B.J. Armstrong could shoot the long ball. But it's not even like those guys were all playing at the same time. It would be one or the other playing at the same time with Mike to space the floor out. Steve Kerr. All right? So when you look at Mike attacking the Pistons, in close quarters, he was always taking the action to them. Never settling, never fading, never, never, never what it looks like to be quitting. What it looks like to be quitting. Not saying LeBron James has quit, but there's been some moments where he, he, he faded in big moments. We've never seen Mike fade in a big moment. We've never seen him fade in a big moment. Even even Magic Johnson, when they called him Tragic Johnson, I think that was the 87 finals, I think. But they one year they called him Tragic Johnson. He didn't play well, but he wasn't fading to obscurity. There's one thing if you don't play well, but you still attack. There's another thing when you fade into obscurity. You've seen LeBron fade. Never seen Mike fade. You see Mike take these guys to the promised land, right? You never see him in public talk about how bad this player is, how bad this player is. You you know, Mike obviously loved North Carolina guys. And if you look at his career, he always had North Carolina guy 
on staff. He always wanted North Carolina guys because he felt like those guys learned how to play the game and he could play with those guys. But at the end of the day, Mike still looked at what he had on his roster and he went out there and he attacked. And to some degree, LeBron James, James does too. But now we're starting to learn that LeBron James has probably a little bit more influence over who goes to that team. And then when those guys come to that team, it become, he becomes a very difficult person to play with. And Mike has his flaws too. But at the end of the day, for Mike, it was all about just take your team to the promised land, just attack. Just take your team to the promised land and attack. And he did it all in one, he did it all in one city, which is something to be commended. Mike didn't go anywhere else to get a championship. He didn't team with anybody else to get a championship. He's not going to Cleveland, to Miami, back to Cleveland, and back to somewhere else. There's been reports that Kobe, that, that, that uh, LeBron might even join the Houston Rockets or the, 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 um, the Golden State Warriors if, if, if the money is right. Mike would never do that. Mike would never do that. Mike, Mike is like, I'm going to either take my team to the promised land or we're going to get our ass kicked. And you know what? He did, it in, he did it in Washington. He sacrificed his career. He sacrificed his legacy. He sacrificed his numbers. Because he wanted to teach those young guys how to compete. Simple as that. You're going against, he's on one leg and you're going against guys. He's going against guys in their prime. Paul Pierce in his prime. Ray Allen in his prime. Kobe in his prime. Tracy McGrady in his prime. He was going at, he was one of these young guys in the time where that two guard position was locked and loaded. Every, Michael Finley, every other day you was going against a, a, a killer. Derek Anderson, I don't know if you know if you remember him from Kentucky. Derek Anderson was a killer. And then you had, you had guys that were probably, oh, that were probably a, 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 a step below that were still really, really good, you know, two guards. But he was going against those guys every night. Those twos and those threes, taking it to him, getting it taken to him. But at the end of the day, Mike was always attacking. And he didn't make any excuses. He said, let me get better. Let me get, I, we'll, we'll figure it out. And that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's what separates Mike from... LeBron, it's the storyline. If you want to talk numbers, we can talk numbers all, all day, every day. But at some point, you can say, man, going to the finals nine times or eight times is more impressive than winning six championships. And all depending on who you are, you might say six championships. I'd rather win six championships and, and, and then go to the finals six times and lose the majority of them. But the fact that Mike was always attacking, the fact that Mike never complained about his, his teammates and, and, and just used what he had, Right, he may have tried to punk him every day in practice, but at the end of the day, he was he was he was going to use those guys to to to, to reach the to reach the promised land. The fact that Mike practiced, the fact that Mike practiced, and now we have LeBron James who has created a culture where guys don't practice. Now I know NBA practicing for good teams is different than NBA practicing for bad teams, but at the end of the day, we all know that Mike Mike's teams practice they got better right and then we also know that Mike wasn't going to go on anybody else's team to get a championship we all know that Mike was going to stay right where he was and get this money get this championship did was it was it was the thoughts of him being traded at some point yeah late in his career I think it was the 97 last season he said I might go to New York but you know sometimes people say they say crazy things just to kind of get a rise out of the people right but we all know that Mike was going to do what he's going to do in a Bulls jersey and he did it and that's, the, and that's what you get. You get constant attack mode. You get loyalty, or not loyalty, but you get a guy who's willing to take what he has and make it happen, make it work. You also get a guy who does it in one jersey. You also get a guy who's not jumping to somebody else's uh, high-octane team to make it happen. Mike is saying, listen, you can, come hang out. you can come play with me, Dennis Rodman. You can come play with me, but I'm not playing with you. I'll beat you. I'll beat you, but I'm not. I'm not joining anybody's team to 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 win a championship. And and when you when you hear that narrative, there's some pride involved. There's a little bit of pride involved in that. If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it a certain way. And if I gotta take some L's, then so be it. If I gotta take an L with you know because I didn't jump on this team, I didn't jump on that team because I want to be uh, look at my my, my current roster and. And not look at myself in the mirror, but look at those guys in the mirror and say, you guys can get it done, then I'm going to go somewhere else. 
But on some level, as the, although LeBron is really impressive, that's, just, that's some of the stuff that you get with, with, with the L, LBJ experience. And I'm a LeBron fan. I'm a LeBron fan. I think we need to cherish him because soon we won't see anybody like this for, for, for a while. You know, who's been able to play on this type of level for this long um, and with this much durability. But man, when you get the mic experience, you just get a symbol of toughness, a symbol of resolve, a symbol of constant attack mode. Um, in my in my opinion, he's Russell Rushbrook, he's Kawhi Leonard, and he is uh, uh, Butler, like all wrapped up in one. You get that relentlessness, you get that toughness, you get that 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 intensity, you get that skill, you get you get the, the clutch, the, the clutch, you know, the G. You get all that. You get all the Butler, Brestbrook, Brestbrook, and Kawhi. You get all those guys wrapped up in one. You get Mike. But the crazy thing about Mike. Mike was just one man. It didn't take three of them to create him, but that he was just he was he was all those things in one man. And he was always in attack mode. And I think that's what separates LeBron from Cole, LeBron from Mike. The fact that with LeBron you get all this other crazy stuff in his narrative. You get all this crazy stuff. And maybe you can blame it on social media. But with Mike, you don't get the craziness. All you get is I'm hoop. Let's let's go out and hoop. Let's go out and hoop. So that's it, man. How much did I talk? How long did I talk? Ooh, 36 minutes. 36 minutes. So, um, yeah, share your thoughts with me. If you get a chance to, you know, social media, um, whether it's Facebook, uh, whether it is um, uh, Twitter or Instagram, I would love to hear. Or if you just, shoot, if you got my number, just holler at me. I would love to hear what you think about my, um, is your confidence conf- uh, circumstantial? narrative with Isaiah Thomas and also hearing about what separates people, what separates Mike from LeBron, what separates LeBron from Mike. So that's it, man. Greatness lives at the edge of, on the edge of death. I am not afraid to die. I will fight for my dreams. I will celebrate my dreams and I will die for my dreams. Thoughts are things. Everything starts off as a thought first. It springs from a place of mindfulness and clarity. My name is Mark Fikes Jr. Mike is the GOAT. Good luck, IT. And we are done.